fucking alive right now. I am live. What's up, y'all? Prophet David Taylor here for this week's weekly live prophetic word. Okay. Hope everybody's been having a good week, all things considered. Uh, hope you've been anchoring in the Lord and um, hope that everything is moving forward in these difficult and challenging times. Because if there was ever a time where we needed to make our calling and election sure, if there was ever a time when we needed to be sure that we were anchored in God, if there was ever a time that we need to be sure that we're doing what the Lord told us to do, that time is now, okay? Because uh, I've discovered that many people are not discerning what season that they're in. We're in uh, as the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, we're in as the days of Noah. The end of much flesh has come up before God. Uh, I'm so glad it's not all flesh. I'm so glad it's not over, over, but it's not the end of all flesh like it was in the days of Noah, but it is the end of much flesh. And so if you know that and you're able to discern that, then, you know, then the Lord can also tell you what to do if you understand what time and what season that you are in. But if not, then, you know, some people get caught unawares and some people get caught and they don't they don't really know what's going on. OK. All right. So we're going to uh, say a word of prayer and dive right into this week's word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, O God, just throwing ourselves on your mercy, throwing ourselves on your grace, stripping ourselves of all pretensions of self-righteousness. Oh, God, we have no righteousness, but Jesus is our righteousness. You are the only righteous one. You are the only holy one. You are the true one. And we give your name all the glory as it is due. God, forgive me for any sin. Wash me clean by your blood and fill me with the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, breathe through me. Speak through me, O God. I surrender my mind, my heart, my mouth, my lips, my hands, gestures, everything that I'm saying, oh God, uh, my teeth, my tongue, I surrender it to your control. God, breathe through me, speak through me, and let the words be spoken that you want spoken, oh God, that you might be glorified, that your kingdom might be glorified, that your purposes might continue to be revealed and released upon the earth, and that those that believe and receive would be edified and strengthened and encouraged and fine-tuned and sharpened to be what you are calling us to be in these times. And that for any unbelievers watching, that they would be challenged to know you. They would be challenged to come out of the kingdom of darkness, come out of being their own Lord and come into the kingdom of light where you are our Lord and where you die to give us abundant life and to give us instructions on how to live that life every day. And we thank you for it and we believe you for it. We're expecting great things and we declare and decree that this broadcast is blessed and that signs and wonders and miracles will follow those that receive this word you are releasing. So in Jesus name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. All right. Oh, amen, Sister Vanita. Sister Vanita, God bless you. So glad to see you. Uh, again, thanks to all of you who are uh, watching me live. If you're watching me live, uh, please like and share the video because whenever there's a prophetic word released, we want that video to, to get to as many people as possible. Uh, we want the body of Christ to hear it and we want the world, we want unbelievers to hear it as well so they can be challenged to put their trust in God because in these days, where else are you gonna go? Where else are you gonna turn? What, what, what else is there? Because everything else that man knows, everything that we've tried to do and our own strength has failed and keeps failing. So now's the time to put your strength and your trust in God, okay? All right. Today's prophetic word is speedily. Today's prophetic word is speedily, right? Speedily, just like it sounds. I will put that on the screen so you can see it. Today's prophetic word is speedily, okay? And then uh, we're going to look at our scripture reference, and then we're going to release uh, the Spirit of God. We'll show us some new things that we haven't seen before that we can walk in and apply to our lives right now, okay? All right. 
Our scripture reference is Luke 18 and 8. Luke 18 and 8. So I will put that on the screen as well. Now, when I say put it on the screen, those of you that are listening to me on the podcast and those of you that are watching on Periscope, uh, I'm talking about putting it on the screen on the Facebook Live. So the stuff I'm putting on the screen as I minister is through the Facebook Live channel, and that's facebook.com slash Prophet David Taylor. Uh, on the YouTube channel, the scriptures will actually come up in the video. So you can also see the scriptures there, but I strongly encourage you to, uh, you know, if you're watching on your phone, if you have a physical Bible or wherever you have the word of God to look up the scriptures as I'm talking. Okay. Luke 18 and eight, we're going to read out of several translations as always. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to start with verse 17, excuse me, uh, verse 7, Luke 18, verse 7 and 8, because uh, that's going to make more sense in context. We're going to look at Luke chapter 18, verses 7 and 8. Now, uh, as you know, Luke wrote the uh, third book of the New Testament. Luke was a doctor. Luke starts off his gospel by saying that there are a lot of things that happened when Jesus walked to earth, which was true. A lot of stuff was going on when the Lord walked to earth as a man. And I know it happened so fast from their point of view, and it was revolutionary and it was radical and it completely changed everything about everything. And so Luke said, I need to write down an account of what happened so people can know what happened from an eyewitness point of view. And again, Luke was a doctor. And so that's who you're listening to when you listen to the, uh, the third gospel or the book of Luke. Okay. So Luke chapter 18, verses seven and eight. And we're going to read out of several translations. Verse seven says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? That's the NIV version. Okay. New Living Translation. Even he rendered, the verse before is talking about an unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people, cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? New Living Translation. English Standard Version, will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? Berean Study Bible, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he continue to defer their help? Let's move on now to verse 8, Luke chapter 18, verse 8, New International Version. I tell you, the I there is Jesus. Jesus says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? New Living Translation, I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? English Standard Version, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Berean Study Bible, I tell you, he will promptly carry out justice on their behalf. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Oh, amen. So lots there to unpack. Let's go back to verse 7. It says, will not God, now the Lord has drawn this comparison. The whole thing is a parable. It's an analogy. And before the Lord talked about how there was a judge that was not just, he didn't fear God or man. Those are in the verses in Luke chapter 18, right before these two, where there was a judge that did not fear God or man, but there was a person that kept warring the judge, kept pressing in on the judge, kept crying out to the judge. And even the unjust judge had to give this person justice because of their persistence in crying out to him and bothering him and worrying him and pressing him, avenge me, avenge me, give me justice, give me justice. And they wouldn't stop crying until even an unjust judge was moved. <clears throat> Excuse me. So why would the Lord use that analogy? Because he's trying to say that even the unjust judge eventually rendered a just decision in the end. So then he goes on to say, will not God, the Holy One, the just one, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he continue to defer their help? Lots in there to unpack. 
So the first thing that I want to point out to you is <clears throat> you need to understand what the fight has been from the beginning. When you say, Prophet Taylor, I said, you need to understand what the fight has been from the beginning. What do you mean by that? I'll show you what I mean. Uh, Genesis chapter three, verse one. This is the devil through the mouth and the body of the serpent talking to Eve, the first woman. Now the serpent was more crafty or subtle than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Verse four, you will not certainly die. King James says, you will not, ye will not surely die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay. What has been the fight from the beginning? I'll tell you what. The fight from the beginning has been about God's character. Mm -hmm. From the beginning, when the devil opens his mouth to weave his web of deception on Eve, on the first woman, what he does is, remember that the devil did not overpower Adam and Eve. He brought them some new information. Adam was not deceived, but Eve was. But what the devil did, you see it in verse uh, five, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. The devil was telling Eve that there was something that God was holding back, that there was more revelation, more knowledge, more power, more status, more to be gained over there in disobedience and sin. So God told Adam and Adam told Eve, if you eat that fruit, if you separate from me, you're going to die. The devil said, no, no, you're not going to die, which was a straight up lie. He said, God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes are going to be open. You'll be like God. There will be an elevation is what the devil told the first woman. He was casting aspersions on the character of God. That has been the fight from the beginning. That's why I wanna read you that passage in Genesis three. And let me put that on the screen here. Uh, again, and when I say on the screen, I mean Facebook Live. From the beginning, the fight has been the devil casting aspersions on the character of God, trying to make us believe what he said to Eve, that somehow God is holding something back from us, that somehow God hasn't told us everything we need to know, that somehow there's a higher level of existence. There's a, what we call these days a glow up. There's an upgrade. There's more over there in sin and disobedience. See, Eve, there's more over here if you disobey God, if you don't believe what God said, because he was lying to you. What God said about that dying thing, that ain't, he was lying. But rather, there's an, uh, uh, an upgrade that you will receive if you get over here in disobedience. All that is straight up lies, that's the devil. But he plied Eve with the idea of there was gonna be a status upgrade if you disobeyed God. That's been the fight from the beginning is God's character, is the devil trying to tell us in as many different ways as he can that God doesn't love us, that God is somehow holding something back, that God is not trustworthy, that what he says isn't actually true. That's been the fight from the beginning. Okay, that's why I wanted you to see that. So back to our main scriptures, Luke 18, seven and eight. So the Lord said, even though the un, even we see the unjust judge bringing justice, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he continue to defer their help? Okay, to be long spirit, to be forbearing or patient uh, is what that means. And their help, uh, help on, help to, help against the enemy, help on the basis of, things like that. And the Lord says, 
that will he continue to keep putting them off? Will he continue to defer their help? Will he delay long over them is what it says in the English Standard Version. Will the Lord delay long over them? Okay. And then the Lord says this. He says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. New Living Translation, I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. English Standard Version, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. I tell you, will he, he will probably carry out justice on their behalf. Now, I know some of, the, some of you looking at me and listening to me right now, I know some of you have been in situations where you have felt like you have cried out to God and you have cried long and you have cried hard and you have cried from your depths and you have opened up your soul and you've poured out yourself before God to ask God for justice. And it seems like maybe the Lord didn't hear you or it seems like maybe things were taking a long time or it seems like uh, a whole bunch of things were other going on and it looks like that didn't happen, okay? So what's the issue? What's the answer? What's the solution? And the answer is in the second half of verse eight when the Lord says, nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find faith? That word there coming out of the Greek means faith, belief, trust, confidence, fidelity and faithfulness. Remember that I told you that God's promises require faith to work. You have to believe them. And I'm sad to say in many situations, what has happened is that, uh, let me put the title on there along with the description. We have not preached speedy justice. And if we haven't preached it, then the people haven't believed it. And according to our faith, so it is unto us. When you preach stuff like, oh, you know, you got to learn how to wait on God. And, oh, you know, you got to learn how to suffer and you got to learn how to tear. And I'm not saying that was wrong in its day, but I'm saying that's why I do my No More Genie series. We have to look at what the Bible actually says. And what the Lord says is that even an unjust judge will render a just decision if you keep crying out. And then he says, shall not God bring about justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? So the first thing we got to do is, have we cried out to God day and night? Have we been faithful in prayer? Because that is the key. Have we been faithful in our prayers to God? Have we been faithful in our confession? Have we been faithful? Have we gotten a word from the Lord, stood right there and said, no matter what, no matter uh, any type of evidence or opposition to the contrary, I believe what God says and we stood right there because that's what Adam should have done when the devil came calling. Remember, that's what Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness, Jesus said, it is written. Jesus stood right there on the word of God. He didn't bargain with the devil. He didn't negotiate with the devil. He didn't feel sorry for himself. He didn't say, why is this happening to me? He didn't say any of the things that we say. All that Jesus said was, it is written. And then he stood on the word and that was it. Okay. So the first thing is, is that, is that what we've been doing? Have we been crying out to God day and night or have we just been crying? Mm. I know sometimes now I ain't nothing wrong with crying. You gotta let your emotions out. You gotta let it out sometimes as you snap and go crazy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, have we really been praying? Have we really been crying out to God day and night? Like the scripture says, because we have to follow what the scripture says to the T to get the result. If you want the promise of God, you gotta follow out the principles of God. Have we been crying out to God in prayer or have we just been crying? Have we just been crying? Okay, because if you've just been crying, then that's not prayer. Okay, that can bleed over into self-pity. That can bleed over into pessimism. 
that can bleed over into cynicism. That can bleed over into being self-critical. Because one thing I know for sure we do, I know I struggle with it, I know we struggle with it. The one thing that we do when we get in trouble is we begin to condemn ourselves. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 1, that there's no condemnation to believers, those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after flesh, but after the spirit, but we sure. Now the Bible does not say there's no consequences in Christ, so don't get that twisted. But I know we sure many times start moving into areas that begin to short circuit our faith because sometimes we're not crying out to God day and night. Sometimes we just crying. And sometimes we're feeling sorry for ourselves and sometimes we're hating other people. And sometimes we're blaming others and sometimes we're gossiping and sometimes we're doing a lot of things. So let me give you a challenge. I want you to measure how much time you spend talking about your problem versus how much time you spend crying out to God about your problem. Okay, so do that this week. Just just take a measure, some kind of way, you know, your phone, tape record yourself, whatever, however you want to do it. And just look at how much time you might spend counting your troubles versus crying out to God day and night. And you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed at the ratios. You'll be amazed at what you find because complaining and crying is not crying out to God in prayer. That's not the same thing. Okay? Do you see what I mean? So once again, if we want the, the blessings of God and we want the results of God, we have to do what the scripture actually says. And so the Lord says that his elect, that's talking about us believers, Christians, saved people, God will bring out justice for us who cry out to him day and night, day and night. A morning prayer, an evening prayer, a prayer when you wake up, a prayer when you go to bed, a prayer before you have breakfast, before you feed your physical body, spend some time in the word, spend some time with the Lord and feed your spirit, man. Uh, a prayer before you go to bed at night. How much time? Are you actually spending, or if you don't do it that way, maybe you 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 have the kind of flow where you talk to the Lord a lot as you go during your day, like as your workflow goes, or like some people do, like Daniel, some people have a dedicated prayer time right in the middle of the day, lunchtime. But whatever your time, whatever your flow with God is, because that's different for different people, but whatever your flow with God is, what are the ratios? <laughs> What are the ratios? Like when we get on the phone and stuff uh, and, and we list all the problems, ain't nothing wrong with talking about your problems. Ain't nothing wrong with talking to your friends. You're supposed to, that's why you have friends so you can get it out. But I'm saying compare the amount of time you spend doing that versus the amount of time you actually spend talking to the Lord about it. Think about that. So the Lord says we got to, as believers, we got to cry out to him day and night. Then he says, he asks a very strange question. Will he continue to defer their help? Will he continue to deny their help, delay their help? There are many different translations. Okay. Now, uh, if you've been in an experience like that, huh, okay, I got to be careful here because there's because I have to step carefully here. One of the mistakes that have happened over sometimes the teaching that we've received in our religious backgrounds is to try to slap a label of one size fits all, one scripture fits all, uh, one, one, uh, one answer from God is the, uh, the answer for every situation. And that is not true. That is why you have to develop your own prophetic walk with God. What do I mean by that? And I'm about to give you an example from the scripture. Uh, what I mean by that is you have to ask the Lord what's going on in your situation. See, what God has been doing or trying to do during this pandemic is to get us as individuals to make our calling and election sure, because we are out of other options. Now, this hit me this week, and I'm going to share it with my listening and my viewing audience, 
Don't you realize that some of y'all are never going to shake your pastor's hand again in this life? Let me say that one more time. Some of y'all, now, if you went to a big mega church, you probably never got a chance to shake the, shake the hand anyway. But if you went to a medium sized church or a smaller sized church, do you realize that some of y'all are never going to get to shake the hand of your pastor again in this life? On this side of glory, you ain't going to never shake his or her hand again. Did you know that? You might not ever, ever physically be in their presence again. And even if you are, you might not, uh, you might not be able to touch them or shake their hand. Why do I say that? Because so many of us have built our theology, have built our relationship with God, have built our everything around church and church life and denominationalism and religion and all my pastor and all my prophet and all my apostle and all my teacher and all those things. Some of those people, you are never going to physically be in their presence again. Do you understand that? Why do I say something like that? Because you got to know God for yourself. That's my point. And so. So what God has been trying to do in these past five months, because it feels like it's been five years, Lord have mercy. What God has been trying to do is teach us as individuals, challenge us, do we really know him? Do we know him for ourselves? And are we walking in his perfect will? That's what this time has been about for those of us that have survived, because a lot of people haven't survived. A lot of people haven't made it through these past five months, and a lot of people aren't going to make it out of 2020. But for those that have and those that are seeking his face, he's been fine tuning and he's been polishing to get us where he wants us to be, to get us in the center of his will. So I say that to say that when the Lord talks about deferring their help, there may be something you've been praying about for a long time, something you've been believing God for and it hasn't manifested and you might be frustrated. I stopped by to challenge you with this idea. Maybe the Lord is trying to get your attention. Maybe that situation has persisted because the Lord is trying to get your attention to show you where you are in error. To show you, to show you that there are some things in your life that are not aligned the way he wants them aligned. Now that is not true in every case, but sometimes it is true. You have to ask the Lord for yourself. That's why you've heard me say over and over and over again, you better develop your own prophetic. You better develop your own relationship with the Bible, the written word. You better develop your own relationship with Jesus. And you better learn how to get a rainbow word from God, a fresh breathe right now in the moment word from God that normally comes through the prophetic. You better develop your own relationship because some people you're never going to be in the, the presence of your pastor again. Some people, you're never going to shake your pastor's hand again. Do you realize that? Do you, I don't care what size church you go to. Some, you, some people, you are never going to shake their hand again. And I say that to help you understand that you need to be knowing the Lord for yourself. That's what time this is. Now, let me give you a scriptural example of what I mean. One of my favorite scriptural examples is Daniel chapter 10. Daniel is so deep, you could just spend an entire year just reading Daniel alone. Daniel's so deep. There's so much revelation. There's so much information in Daniel. Wow. But anyway, in Daniel chapter 10, there's a situation where Daniel uh, was fasting uh, for three full weeks. Uh, so that's a better part of a month. And he says he ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh or wine, no meat or drink, neither did I anoint myself at all. He didn't put any oil on his face, anything, for three full weeks. And Daniel was trying to get a word from the Lord. He was trying to understand a vision. And at the end, he saw an angel and uh, or he saw a vision of the Lord. Uh, and Daniel said the men that were with him didn't see the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them. But Daniel saw the vision himself. And then there are these words. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Then he said unto me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I'm come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. So what I have heard over the course of my life 
is people saying that every situation is that situation I just read in Daniel 10. That God heard you as soon as he did. He did hear you as soon as you cried out. But that the angels are in the heavenlies fighting to get the answer through, and that's been the delay. Sometimes that is true. Sometimes it is true that God released the angel as soon as you prayed, and there's been a war in the heavenlies. But sometimes <laughs> what the issue is, is that if it looks like God has been deferring or delaying your answer, it's because he's trying to get your attention. And the reason he's trying to get your attention is because there are some things in your life he's trying to put his finger on. There's some things in your life he's trying to identify. There's some things in your life he's trying to show you that are out of alignment. And when we are out of alignment with Jesus, Jesus is the head of the church and we are his body. When we are out, when we are out of alignment with Jesus, that is bones out of joint. If you've ever broken a bone or you ever had a bone out of joint, you know how painful that is. Well, that's the pain that the Lord feels when we're out of his perfect will. When we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, when we're not being who we're supposed to be, when we're not right with him, we cause him pain because we're bones out of joint, we're out of alignment. And so sometimes God is trying to put his finger on something specifically. And he's he's he heard you, but he's trying to get your attention to show you that this isn't lining up or this isn't right, or this, I'm pleased with this and I'm pleased with this, but I'm not pleased with that, okay? Prophet Taylor, can you prove that by scripture? Yes, I can. Revelation chapter two and chapter three is two whole chapters in the Bible of the Lord giving grades and the Lord giving details about what he is pleased with and what he's not pleased with to the church, okay? Revelation chapters two and three, okay? Go look it up, okay? That is two whole chapters in the New Testament. It's not the Old Testament. It's Jesus speaking from heaven now in his exalted position as the high priest, as the intercessor, re-glorified again as God, as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last, and the one that has the keys of hell and death. That's the Lord speaking from the right hand of God to his church. And he says seven times in those chapters, he that hath an ear, let him hear what? Let him hear what the spirit saith, not has said, not will say. Saith, is saying to the church, and there's your key. So if it looks like the Lord has delayed or deferred, or it looks like that the Lord hasn't answered you speedily, First thing you got to do is go and ask yourself, have I really been crying out to God day and night like I'm supposed to? But second of all, is there anything in my life he's not pleased with? Is there anything out of my life that's out of alignment? And now let me hasten to say, that does not mean you're living in sin because everything out of alignment doesn't mean sin. Some things are infirmity and some things are, are ignorance. Infirmity is when I'm wounded or I'm not well in a certain area, sometimes you can see physical infirmities and sometimes you can't, just like the COVID virus. Uh, sometimes you can't see every physical infirmity, but sometimes you can. Like if you broke your elbow or something, you can see that. Infirmities in your soul, you can't see that. You can't see that you're not healthy inside and just something happens and you get triggered. <laughs> and then when you get triggered and something happens and you have to blow up, that's when you know, okay, that's a landmine in my soul. That's a sensitive area. Okay, I'm a little sensitive about that. Maybe I'm not totally healthy. But infirmities are not always things that you can see. Infirmities are not sin. Sometimes infirmities can lead us to sin, and sometimes we medicate our infirmities with sin. But infirmities are not actually sin. So sometimes the Lord is trying to help you deal with an infirmity, like a scar you got as a child that has so warped your view of life until you can't see God or yourself clearly. Now, I know I didn't have to deal with some of that. <laughs> I know I've had to deal with some of those. I don't know about you, but I'm speaking for myself. It is not sin, but it's something that happened to you that so warped your worldview until you can't see God clearly and you can't see yourself clearly. That's an infirmity. That's not sin. And then sometimes what you're dealing with is ignorance. Now, not ignorant and not ignorant. <laughs> 
Ignorant is when you don't know nothing. Ignorant is when you don't know nothing and you proud of not knowing nothing and you don't want nobody else to know nothing. Okay, see, that's ignorant. Ignorant is a different level than ignorant. Okay, but ignorance means I just didn't know. I'm unaware. I didn't know. That's not the same as being ignorant, which is I'm a know nothing kind of person and ignorant that I'm proud to know nothing. No. Ignorance means I didn't know. I didn't know that this thing I'm dealing with, I didn't know it worked that way. I didn't know. So maybe the Lord is trying to get your attention to show you that in this area, you don't actually know how to do what you're trying to do. Now, can you see that that is not sin? That's not sin. I mean, in the sense of, you know, us trying to purposely doing something wrong. That's I'm trying to accomplish this, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing it wrong. That's why I'm not getting the results because I'm not doing this the way I need to be doing it. You see what I mean? And so sometimes the Lord might be trying to, trying to point that out to you as well. So let's a uh, few more, a little bit here, and then I'll be able to finish up. But the point that I wanted to make there is that if it seems like you have cried out to God and it seems like the Lord hasn't answered you, it's not that God didn't hear you. Maybe he's trying to get your attention. But my point here is that you have to seek his face and ask him, what is going on in my situation? Please show me, show me where you and I are in relationship to each other and where you want me to be so I can get in the center of your perfect will, because that's where the flow comes. If those of you that have been in the flow, you know what I'm talking about. The flow comes when you get into full obedience with God. And for those of you that haven't been in the flow yet, just wait till you get in the flow, because you'll never want to not be in it. That was the Lord's secret. When the Lord walked the earth as a man, he stayed in the flow. He stayed in the perfect will of the Father. Everything that the Father wanted him to do down to small details, the Lord made it his business to be sure to accomplish that every day. That means he stayed in the flow of God. And once you get in the flow, that's when all the power comes. That's when the blessings comes. That's when everything you look for comes when you get in the flow. Okay. So the Lord says, I tell you, he will promptly carry out justice in their behalf. I'm back on Luke 18, 8. The Lord says, I tell you, he will promptly carry out justice on their behalf. Now, <laughs> I got to go back in the archives for this one. Okay, I got I to gotta deal with another top 10 misquoted scripture. Okay. Top 10 misquoted scriptures. I heard this so much when I was growing up. Okay. It would be Psalms 27 and 14. Psalms 27 and 14. That scripture says, wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I heard that a lot when I was growing up. You got to learn how to wait on God. Okay, let me, that never sat well with me because it didn't make a lot of sense to me. So let me explain something to you. When you go back into the Hebrew, you go, go back into the original language, that word there, wait, it does not mean like a passage of time. It does not mean God promised you something in 2016 and you've been waiting four years for it to show up. That's not what that word means. We know that can happen, but that's not what that scripture means. That word there translated wait in English, it means in Hebrew, it means to minister or to serve. <laughs> Lisa make me laugh about we sing that song. <laughs> uh, it means to minister, minister or to serve God like a waiter. It means to serve him. In other words, it means to go before the Lord and tend to him, wait on God. And how do you wait on God? You go before him with praise, with thanksgiving. You bow down before him. You bring your tears before God. You bring your supplications before God. You, you bring your dances before God. You clap your hands. You ask the Lord, do you need anything? How do you want me to praise you today? How do you want me to glorify you today? Do you want to spend time with me? You spend time ministering to God. You spend time giving him praise lauding him. Yes, yeah, see, yeah, see, I feel that anointing coming when I say that. Lauding him, magnifying him, glorifying him, bowing down before him, giving him the praise that's due his name. That's what it means. It means a minister to God. You know, we can't give the Lord a cup of water. We can't give the Lord a cheeseburger. 
He said, the cow on a thousand hills is mine. If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell y'all. We can't give the Lord that. We can't give the Lord anything, but he has ordained for us to be speaking spirits like he is. So we can come before him and give him praise, give him honor, give him affection, give him love. That's what that scripture means. It means to minister before the Lord. Then he encourages your heart. Then he renews your strength and you mount up with wings like eagles. Because that's true. Because when you spend time doing that with God, just like I felt the rush of the anointing as I said it, when you spend time doing that with God, then God does strengthen you. So that is one of the top 10 misquoted scriptures in the Bible where people have been saying that that scripture, Psalm 27, 14, means that God told you one thing at this point in time, and you just got to hold out till your change come. Lord have mercy, that's not what that scripture means. That's also not what was going on in Job's life. I don't have time to do that whole thing. But I stopped by the tip, this is why I tip. Don't you hear me say all the time, this is why you have to read the Bible for yourself? Did you know that the same thing that happened to Job happened to King David? Did you know that bands of raiders came and stole all of David's uh, wives and money and property and sheep and cattle? And, and the devil went after David just like he went after Job. Job, because he had religion and not relationship, said the Lord gives and the Lord takes away and sat down. David cried and cried and cried till he cried all his tears out. Then David looked up to heaven and said, God, what shall I do? And the Lord said, pursue them and you shall recover all. If God is no respecter of person, and he's not, and David and Job both served the same God, what was the difference in their results? The difference was that Job had religion. David had relationship. Job was trusting in his righteousness because when his friends came to accuse him, Job defended himself by talking about all the things he did and didn't do. King David never trusted in his own righteousness. David knew he didn't have no righteousness. So he trusted in God's mercy. He had a relationship with God and he said, what should I do? And the Lord said, go, you shall recover all. Job got twice as much in the end, 42 chapters later, and David got it right away. That's what I'm trying to tell you, that you can't slap scriptures as a one size fits all solution onto your situation. You have to personally ask Jesus, where are we? Where am I in your eyes? Am I, can I see you clearly? Can I see myself clearly? Am I doing what you want to do? What are you pleased with? What are you not pleased with? Am I ignorant in any area? Am I just doing it wrong? That kind of thing. And this situation during the pandemic has been about that. You making sure you're, you're allowing God to do the fine tuning of your life that he wants. And if you've missed that, you've missed the point of this isolation. If you have missed that, you have missed the point of this isolation. If you were in a hurry to get back to the way it was, it ain't gonna never be the way it was. Remember I told you some of y'all, ain't, you ain't gonna never shake your pastor's hand again in this life. It ain't, what we had ain't never coming back. God tore it all down, okay? God tore it all down. It ain't never coming back. So you, you're missing it if you think that you're just waiting on things to get back to normal. The point of this time has been for you because you've been able to spend a lot of time with you <laughs> or you and God for the Lord to be able to fine tune whatever it is he's trying to do in your life. So now having said all that, let me get to this and I'll be done. So Luke 18 and eight says, I tell you, he will promptly carry out justice on their behalf. He will grant justice to them quickly. But when the son of man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? Okay, in the Greek, it says faith, belief, trust, confidence, fidelity, and faithfulness. Okay, and I stopped by to tell you that that's the key to getting the swift justice to flow. It's getting in the perfect will of God. The Lord said, see, you remember for God to move, he always requires faith. So away with these people that have been teaching you the genie concept of God that tells you that God is magic. And all you have to do is say in Jesus name, and if you say it real religious, you know, or if you, if you, you know, if you do the hokey pokey and put your left foot in and put your left foot out and put your right foot in and turn it all about, that if you do that, that God's going to magically, you need to get away from folks like that. You need to do what the words say because things only work based on what the words say. 
God only responds based on what the word said. You can't claim a promise before God that he didn't say. Okay? We have a covenant in the Bible. That means we have to read the contract so we can understand the terms of the contract. That's not hard to understand. But when you start making up terms that ain't in the contract, why do you think God has to honor that? God don't have to honor no parts of your program. Anything that you made up that ain't scripture, God don't have to honor that. Did you know that? Okay? So the Lord says that he's looking for faith. He's looking for faith, trust, belief, confidence. Then one of the translations of that word says fidelity. Oh, that means have you been faithful to Jesus? That means are you fooling with other gods and the Lord too? Like is something else your God? Is something else maybe first in your life and the Lord is like 1.2 or maybe second in your life? Uh, mm -mm. Then the promise is the flow of God is not going to be there for you if you got other gods before him. Because the first commandment of the 10 is thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the first commandment that Jesus said under the new commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and him only shalt thou serve. So, so the part of that word in English, faith, is translated fidelity and faithfulness, confidence, faith, and trust. That is what God is looking for to move on your half, to give you that quick, give you that speedy justice. Can you see it? So I hope this has been clear. I hope that what I've been saying today has been clear. Uh, so if you want me to sum it up for you, let me put uh, the topic back on the screen. If you want me to sh sum it up for you, and that is that you have got to have your own relationship with God. You have got to have your own relationship with the Bible, the written word of God, your own relationship with Jesus, the living word of God, and your own relationship with the prophetic, the rhema word of God, the fresh breathe right now word of God coming out of God's mouth right now. You've got to have your own relationship with all three levels of word. And the point of the time during this pandemic has been for God to fine tune us individually so that in Revelations 2 and 3, he can give us grades. So he can say, I'm pleased with this, but I'm not pleased with that. You're doing this well, but you're not doing this right. Or you don't know what you're doing in this area. So let me educate you, that kind of thing. That's been the point of this pandemic. And if you're missing that, you're missing the point. You may just have religion, but like I said, some of y'all, you you're never going to physically shake the hand of your prophet, your apostle, your pastor, your evangelist, your teacher again. It's not going to happen. So what are you going to do? Did you ever think about that? Do you ever think about what if, what if church don't ever come back like we had it? I'm not saying it won't. I'm, that's not a prophetic word. I'm just posing the question. What if church never comes back the way we had it before? What would you do? Did you ever think about that? So God is stripping. First, God stripped us corporately of all that religion by shutting down gatherings and congregations, okay? Now, if now, again, don't misunderstand me. If the Lord told you to go and gather and he gave you a word to go gather and he said he would protect you, then obey, do what God told you to do. But some people out there just tempting God, they didn't get a word from the Lord. They just jumping out there and the Lord didn't tell them to do that. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. So once you get all of that in line, then you can most definitely expect the flow of speedy justice. You can expect things to start popping off in your life like they're supposed to. You see that? That's what I'm trying to get you to see. And finally, on that last tip, that's why we have to stop preaching misinterpreted scripture like wait on the Lord, Psalm 27, 14, when it doesn't mean God promised you something at one point in time and then it doesn't happen till here like the Abraham and Sarah thing, where God called Abraham at 75, but he didn't have Isaac till 100. He promised Isaac and he said this time next year and that kind of thing. Because sometimes when the Lord is talking about something that's gonna happen over time, many times he'll tell you, he'll say this time next year, he'll say in, in this season, he'll say during the time of life, he'll say in the harvest, he'll say in summer of next year, he'll say in three months time, he'll say in six months time. So many times when there is, a time manifestation involved, the Lord will tell you, okay? But that's not what Psalm 27, 14 means. So we need to stop preaching and teaching that. And we need to start preaching Luke 18 and eight, that when we are faithful to the Lord and we're confident to the Lord and we cry out to him day and night, and we've been 
putting him first and we allow him revelation two and three to do his fine tuning work on us on us then we can expect that flow that flow the flow is different the flow is different and you can tell the difference between christians because uh some of the stuff we struggling with we could have been past it a long time ago the problem has been that we've been doing it our way you've been trying to claim god promises doing it your way one more time you've been trying to claim god's promises but what you've been doing is you've been doing it your way that's been the problem so if you want that speedy justice you got to follow all the principles that i outline in those verses and you got to let the lord fine tune you and put his finger on anything in your life that he wants to adjust then you can expect things to burst forth don't you know that's what fasting is for i like the way pastor bill winston said it pastor bill winston said that fasting does not move god fasting moves you <laughs> i love that fasting is designed to make you stop paying attention to your flesh and temporarily suspend the needs of your body so you can hear what the lord is saying so your spirit man can be in ascendance. So you're not worried about your stomach and you're not worried about anything else. So it can move you into the will of God. That's the point of fasting. And then your health springs forth speedily and all the promises that we find about fasting. Because once again, that's us. And, and I think that there has been a severe kind of missing it with the saints of teaching all this stuff about how you can just pop your fingers and God is magic. And we're, we're preaching all this stuff about how God is going to do all this stuff. But very rarely do I hear it being said how you have to change, how you have to get in faith, how you have to obey, how you have to seek the, the face of God for yourself, how you have to ask the Lord, am I doing what you want me to do? Am I going where you want me to go? Do I think of myself the way you want me to think of myself? Am I associating with just so many different things? So many different things that are fine tuning so you can get to that quick manifestation. Manifestation. So you, if you wanna to get to that level of faith where you just say stuff and it happens like in 24 hours, like when the Lord cursed a fig tree, the Holy Ghost has to tell you that. That's not something you can just make up. The Holy Ghost got to say, this is a right now thing. This is going to happen like that. And then sometimes if things are going to take more time, the Holy Ghost has to tell you that. The Holy Ghost is going to have to say, this is going to take a little bit more time. This is going to happen over the course of a couple months. Can you see that is a relationship? That is not a religion. That's what the Lord is trying to get us to. And that, my brothers and my sisters, is individual. Do you understand that? Do you understand that that is individual? That is individual. That is individual. That's what's been happening during the pandemic. And if you're not doing that, I stop by to tell you prophetically that you are missing it. You are missing the point of all this isolation. You're missing the point. God does not want you to come out the same on the other side of this as you were when you went in. Bishop Jakes preached a sermon several months ago. I strongly suggest you listen to it. It's called Conversations in a Cave. It is so powerful. It is so powerful. It's life changing because Bishop Jakes talked about maybe God slowed, shut the world down so we could talk. Maybe God was trying to get the attention of the entire planet saying, y'all ain't paying attention to me. So I'm going to shut down everything you're doing because you need to hear what I'm saying to you because I'm God. I'm sovereign. I'm the Lord. I'm the one that decides how all this goes. Can you see that as individual? That's been the point. So those of you that are running around worried about religious things. Some of those things ain't never coming back. I hope all of them never come back. All the stuff, what I mean by that is, all the stuff that we were doing that the Lord wasn't pleased with, I hope that people don't try to build that again. I don't wanna build anything in my life that God has torn down. He tore it down because he wasn't pleased with it. So why in the world would I spend any energy or time trying to build it back? That's religion. I just want to build what he wants me to build. I want to do what he wants me to do. I want to spend my time and energy the way he wants me to. That's how you get in the flow. And that's how you get that speedy justice. Yeah, oh, fingers ain't popping. That's how you get that speedy justice. You understand? All right. So that's why I like to take time to, to ask the Holy Ghost to give me scriptures and why I do prophetic words, why I also do prophetic teaching. 
so you can understand what you hear. Okay, now I feel a word coming. I need to release. Here it comes. For behold, my children, hear me as I speak through the mouth of a prophet. Do not miss what I'm saying. Do not miss me. For I indeed am a person. I'm a person that loves you and died for you. I want a personal relationship. I want to walk with you and talk with you. Be your friend. Be your God. Be your father. Be your savior. Be your lover. Be your deliverer. I want to be all the things to you that I want to be, but I require faith. I require that you believe me. It won't be against your will. It will be a love relationship where I release loving authority and you respond with loving obedience. It will be a loving relationship. That is my deepest desire to have a loving relationship with you individually. For I did not die for us. I died for you, says the spirit of the living God. Wow, amen and amen. Now, I don't know how many of y'all have ever heard that, but the Lord did die for us. I don't know if you knew that, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. No, he died on the cross for your sins. Will the Lord die for us? No, he died for you. What do you mean by that? I mean that God loves each one of us as if we were the only child that he had, if you didn't know that. That means that if everybody on earth was saved and you were the only sinner, the son of God still would have become human and died on the cross because he didn't die for us. He died for you. Did you know that? I know religious people don't know that. You know how I know that? Because religious people just care about form and fashion. First we read the scripture, then we do the prayer. Oh, the worship team is only supposed to sing this long. No, we don't march in. No, we're supposed to march in. That's the wrong road for the day. They care about form and fashion. Not that we shouldn't be decent in order. Don't misunderstand me. Don't twist what I'm saying. But religious people are obsessed with form and fashion. And if the Holy Ghost wants to do something new out of the box, there's no room in religious people's lives for that. That's the difference between religion and relationship because you might have planned some stuff out and then the Holy Ghost begins to move on your spirit and say, the Holy Ghost say, I want to go here. So do this. Even though you plan that, do this. That's relationship. That's what I mean. And religious people are always obsessed with liturgy, with order of service, with form and fashion. No, you wear the white robes on first Sunday. You wear the red robes on third Sunday. No, it's their turn to usher. No, first you, I'm going to bring the pastor out his water. Then you bring out the communion, uh, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's religious folks every time. That's their, they're obsessed with that. That ain't the same as a relationship with Jesus. Because if you know Jesus, you know that can't nobody get ahead of you in line. Can't nobody get behind you in line. Can't nobody take what's yours. You have to give it up. If God has given you something, if God has ordained, for something to happen for you, all you got to do is stay faithful to what the Lord is telling you. Can't nobody stop you. Can't nobody take it from you. And the harder somebody tries, the harder the Lord going to move them out the way, like he moved everybody out the way and lifted Joseph up above, above all the Egyptians. And Joseph was a Hebrew. Joseph was a convict. Joseph was a felon in prison with a false rape accusation. And he became prime minister of Egypt. That's how terrible the Lord is. That's how, when I say terrible, I mean the good terrible, bad, you know. That's how incredible, that's how awesome God is, okay? So if you know him, you know that. If you're religious, you steady fighting, fighting for your space, fighting. Oh, Lord, I've been sitting on this pew for 72 years. Oh, Lord, my family founded this church. Uh, okay, what's I got to do with the Lord is saying, with what the Lord is saying? What's I got to do with that? Zero, that's what. OK, so it's time to move out. It's past time. That's what the pandemic has been about to to kill all that religious stuff that God wasn't pleased with and get on the individual tip with Jesus who did not die for us. But that prophetic word I just got said he want that personal relationship with you. With you. With you. And if you don't have that. You have missed a point in these last five months. All right. Amen and amen. I can go on because there's more. I have to do more next time. I've already gone on an hour. But, you know, when the Holy Ghost gives you prophetic flow. But anyway, so I'm going to pray in tongues and ask the Lord, is there anything else he wants me to release? And then we'll be done.
All right, didn't get anything. Uh, that's another tip to those of you that are, are walking, trying to grow in the prophetic. Don't force it. You never have to force the prophetic. Okay, if the Spirit of God is going to breathe something into you, he'll breathe it into you. The prophetic is a flow. You don't have to force it. The Spirit of God will show you or not. Okay, he's gentle like a dove. He will guide us into all truth. He doesn't bop us over the head into all truth. Okay, you don't have to force a lot of people say, well, how can I prophesy and I've never done it before? You just begin to let it out. There's a flow to it. Yes, you have to practice it, but you don't have to force it. Okay. All right. That's it. Uh, praise God. Thank you so much for those of you that watch me live. Thank you. Those of, me, those of you that are watching the replay, please like and share the video because we wanted to go as many places as possible because when a prophetic word comes forth from the Lord, we wanted to bless as many believers as we can and we wanted to challenge as many unbelievers as we can. Uh, now, you know, I don't do what I do for money, but if you'd like to sow into my ministry, uh, my cash app is on uh, my Facebook live page and my Twitter and uh, my website. Uh, if you'd like to sow into my ministry and bless me financially, because that helps uh, me do all the things that I'm doing. And when I say all the things that I'm doing, uh, I have a music ministry. My music ministry, ministry is Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross. That's been my band since 1999, if you didn't know that. I've had my band, I've had different incarnations of my band, but I've had Shades of the Cross since 1999. Okay, uh, that's my music ministry. I have my prophetic devotional uh, to where you can develop your own prophetic. Uh, now, people always ask me, where's the link to get the prophetic devotional? So I'm gonna put that on the screen. It's a long link, uh, but I'm gonna put that on the screen. Remember <clears throat> that you can also always go to prophetdavidtaylor.org to my website and you can find all those links there. But when you sow into my ministry, remember that you get a prophet's reward. So whatever anointing you've seen me flow in, that begins to flow in your life. Your more visions, more dreams, tongues. Uh, I also have interpretation of dreams and there's actually been quite a few people that have asked me to interpret their dreams. So whenever you, you sow into the life of anybody that ministers in the name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, whatever mantles they have, begin that flow begins to come into your life you begin to get blessed by that flow if you didn't know that so i strongly strongly rec recommend that you get um my daily prophetic devotional it's quarter three and quarter four will be out in october i strongly recommend that you get it because you need to develop your own prophetic one more time. You need to develop your own prophetic walk with God. You need to develop your own relationship with God. You need to develop your own prophetic so you can get a word from the Lord because we're living in a time where that's going to make the difference between life and death. Do you understand that? Do you understand even going to the grocery store? You better pray and you better pray in tongues. Should I go? Should I go to this store? Should I go now? Did you know that? Did you know in the morning you're supposed to give your whole day to God? I said, Lord, today I need to go grocery store. I need to do this and I need to do that. Do you know that you should have talked to God about that before you started your day and let the Holy Spirit lead you? Because you are literally in a situation where that can mean the difference between life and death. Do you understand that? Do you understand that you don't have any business being someplace that you ain't supposed to be out of the will of God? Because it could cost you. That's the kind of situation that we're in. That's why so many saints are dying. You can't presumptuously assume that you can just go out and do stuff. You have to ask the Lord, what is your word to me in this moment for this situation and in this season? You understand? All right. Amen. God bless you. That's it. So I just did my No More Genies a teaching last Thursday. So that video is going to be up uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, and the, the uh, it's number 26 in my No More Genie series. All this is on my website, though. You can find it all on my website. Uh, also, the sign up for my newsletter is on my Facebook Live page. Sign up for my newsletter and you get alerts every week. You get links to the latest videos, the latest books, the latest music, everything I'm doing so you can stay in the loop. OK, amen. God bless you. Thank you again so much to those of you that watch me live, to that so into my ministry, that uh, are looking at the replay. Those of you that are listening to the podcast, thank you so much. God bless you. And uh, remember that it's time to let the Lord fine tune us so we can get in his flow and we can get our justice speedily. All right. I'll see you same time next week, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time.
for the next weekly live prophetic word. Amen and God bless. Strive and cut me off.